Okay. So, in these sessions, we are going to be broadly based on this book that you now will have, Cyclic Evolution. Before I start in on that, there are just one or two introductory remarks that I'd like to make about the nature of the study that we're going to engage upon. You might ask yourself, and you probably already have at some juncture, why do we bother to study this sort of information at all? Why should we clutter our minds up with the details of cycles and monads and rounds and races and all of that sort of stuff? And as I said last night, if you looked at it from the point of view of acquiring information, you would indeed be wasting your time. It is not about acquiring information. If we were approaching this from the point of view of an academic study, if we were going to take our master's degree in theosophy, then there might well be point in acquiring information, because then we could produce it at the appropriate examination point and be shown to know the ins and outs of theosophical doctrine and we might well be able to add PhD or MSc to our name. If that would make us any happier, I'm not, I'm not too sure, but at least we could do it. However, for the most of us, this is not what we're about. We've been drawn to theosophy in our various ways, all, I suspect, in one degree or another, because we are searching after some insight, some wisdom, some something fundamental about ourselves and about nature. And that is why the theosophical doctrines which have been promulgated for us are worthy of our study. However, and this is a large however, they are not an end in themselves. They are a means to an end. And each one of us will discover what, they are, uh, an end, what that end is as and when we begin to develop those sorts of insights for ourselves. I'm reminded of the Buddhist analogy, the story that the Buddha gave, very short analogy of the, the analogy of the, of the raft. If you're crossing a stream on a raft, the raft is a means to get to the other shore, but when you get to the other shore, you don't carry the raft with you. Very equally, in the, in, in the studies that we're doing here, the ideas that we're studying are means, like the raft, which we are utilizing in uh, the beginnings of our journey. But once these things become real for us, there will certainly be no need to study books on the subject, more or less uh, recondite as the case may be. Perhaps we could liken the whole process to that of studying a map. If you're going to undertake a journey, you might be well advised to study a map first to find out something of the nature of the land that you're going to encounter. And depending on the nature of the information you want, so you'll look at different maps. Maybe it'll just be a straightforward <coughs> road map, which will tell you the major roads and the towns that you'll encounter. Perhaps something of the geography, the mountains and rivers and so forth that you will encounter. You're doing this before you start the journey, so that as you undertake the journey, you will recognize the features when you get there, and you'll know that you are going in the right direction, and you're not lost. So with this information, we're studying it in very much that same sort of vein as a, a series of indicators as to the nature of reality. But the books themselves and the ideas that they convey are not that reality. What do we get out of books? Well, a lot of words, that's for sure. But behind the words, largely for us, ideas, concepts. It would be a grave mistake to m think that the ideas or the concepts were that reality. Largely what we do, certainly in terms of language and mostly in terms of thought and concept, is to uh, I was going to say play with, but perhaps that's uh, 
got the wrong connotations. We, we play with these ideas and words, and we juggle them around, and there is a lot of intellectual pleasure to be gained in just this sort of mental jugglery of one idea in relation to another. And we can spend a lifetime juggling words and ideas. And people do do this and derive an enormous amount of satisfaction from it. Fine, if that's what they want to do, that's their affair. But as far as we are concerned, it would be a grave mistake to get stuck with the words and the concepts. If you find that in studying in this form, the words uh, are a barrier, then you're probably pursuing the wrong avenue altogether, and there must be a different road for you to get to the same destination. Uh, perhaps, perhaps this isn't a good avenue for you to pursue. Maybe there is a better one. It is only a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. We do not have to acquire concepts and views. But for many of us, this is the way which we choose to make our approach. We being Westerners and having been trained in our Western ways of thought are peculiarly prone to deal in terms of ideas and concepts. And if we have skills in that area, why not benefit from them? After all, as Madame Blavatsky said in her little introductory booklet on how to study theosophy. She says that uh, jnana yoga, the way of knowledge, is the yoga for the West. Now, that's not to say that it's the only yoga and that we must pursue it to the exclusion of all else. But she was saying something about our Western character, our Western culture, our way of approaching the inner worlds. And if we have talents in this particular area, then let's utilize them. Let's make use of them if we can. But let's not get entrapped by them. That's my, my warning at the outset. As far as, the, as far as the little book is concerned that you have, perhaps it would be appropriate just to say a word or two about the background to the book. I had been studying cyclic evolution over a number of years and had conducted a number of study courses in which topics such as cyclic evolution inevitably came to the fore. And it was plain to me that students had enormous difficulty with this area and there was an enormous degree of confusion as to just what was said and to a degree, what it meant. And it came to me that it would be of benefit to such students if a fairly concise statement as to the basic ideas involved in the theosophical position could be summarized. And that was the initial motivation behind this. And that's really what, uh, the origins of part two of this book. Part two is the chapters 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 which try to outline something of the dynamic process involved in the evolution, certainly of mankind, and incidentally of the other kingdoms. Having done that much, it became abundantly apparent that to give that out to students would be adding to their confusion rather than resolving it, because inevitably, in describing the dynamic process, there are a number of terms which are used extensively in the literature which are the building blocks on which your understanding is founded. And if you haven't got those building blocks, then you're not likely to get very far. So that's why the first, uh, the first section, first part, was added. So chapters 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and 7 discuss and present some of the basic ideas on which the rest of it, the cyclic process, is dependent. As you will have seen if you've read the introduction, part three is just an attempt to justify every major proposition, every major idea in parts one and two by reference to the original literature. And sometimes there's further amplification. 
In the course of the 12 sessions in which I will be involved then, the first six will concentrate on chapters 2 to 7, sections 2 to 7. So today we're going to look at section 2 when we get that far. And this week I think it would be fairly safe to say, though I'm prepared to be proved wrong by events, that we will covers, cover the remaining five chapters in the next five sessions. Now, as I said last night, I would like this to be fairly free format. I have, as you will see, nothing much in the way of notes, apart from what you actually see in front of you here. These are my notes. I remember Ianthi a year or two ago saying that she had a very cunning way of having her notes, which was to put them on the blackboard. And then everyone said, how amazing that you talk without notes. And she said, well, there they are on the blackboard. Well. If you think it's amazing that I'm talking without notes, well, here they are. They're in here. But I would like um, for you to be involved in this. Rather than have this in the form of a lecture where we wait till the end and then you ask questions, within reason, I would be happy to deal with questions as we go along, rather than you forget what it is that you wanted to ask or you get overwhelmed by the next section and, you, f and you, uh, you don't ask the question that you wanted to ask, I would prefer that we dealt with them as we went along. Now, all I ask is that if I appear to be in full flow about something, that you don't stop me in mid-sentence, but wait till an, an appropriate moment before you uh, ask what it is that you want to ask. Just put your hand up, if you will, and then we'll deal with them there and then. Right. Having said that, we can begin. I do not intend to say anything about Chapter 1, Introduction, in either Part 1 or Part 3. You can read that for yourself, and I think the content should be self-evident. It does tell you that the references to the Secret Doctrine are to the original edition. So if you don't have an original edition in front of you and you want to check some of these passages, then you will have to use the concordance which Ianthi referred you to this morning. So, to business. The first of the building blocks on which the cyclic process is going to be dependent is what is discussed in Section 2, Chapter 2, The Seven Kingdoms of Nature. Now, you'll see that this is, in fact, in, presented in two parts. The first part is in Part 1 on page 3 and onwards, and there's another part on page 51, which is where the supporting passages from the literature are to be found, and exactly the same paragraph numbers are used in both parts. So 2.1 on page 3 has a 2.1 on page 51, and the two go hand in glove. Now, this particular subject, the Seven Kingdoms of Nature, I regard as being absolutely fundamental to the whole scheme of things. The Seven Kingdoms of Nature comprised of the what we refer to in theosophical literature as the monads or the monadic essence, terms which we're going to discuss this afternoon, are the actors in this whole drama. They are the central pivots around which the whole drama takes place. There couldn't be anything more important than the actors in the drama. So, I, I want to start what I have to say this afternoon by going back really to first principles a little and outlining a little of what we mean by monad, monads, monadic essence, so that rather than just juggling with yet more words, which don't necessarily mean too much to us, that we begin to have some sort of grasp as to what is going on here. 
When I say we, we go back to first principles, the first principles that I'm in fact going back to here relates to ideas which have already come up this morning and this afternoon. It was Joy, I think, who said again the phrase of Madame Blavatsky's, or maybe it was Yancy, all existence is one thing. Well, rather than saying all existence is one thing, which we now know to be uh, one-sided, I think what she really meant to say is all existence is one thing. <laughs> it was the one that she was important, not the thing. <laughs> and that's where we start. Now, by saying this, what she is saying is that there are not two quite separate factors involved in the cosmic process. There are, the there are philosophical positions which are basically dualist positions, which would talk of spirit and matter as if the two were completely independent factors which in some way interact with one another and at, at the point of junction, at the point where they meet, then one would look for the interaction and work out how the process developed from there. But that is not the theosophical position. The theosophical position is that all of which we are aware, and all of which we could be aware, what, with whatever faculty, however we were developed, is all of a kind. It's all of one substance. It's all of one nature. Within that one nature, then there is a gamut. There is uh, any number of variations on a basic theme. But it's all of a single character at root. We start from one, and then the divergences, the apparent differences, emerge from the context of the one. But the one is always the, the greater context. The fundamental apparencies which appear from this spirit and matter, as we refer to them then, are not to be thought of as two independent principles, but as two poles within one thing. It's as simple as up and down, inside and outside, black and white. These obvious dualities to which we, we refer, we would never think of there being an absolute up or an absolute down. Up is defined by down, down is defined by up. Things are up in relation to other things which are down. Things are white in relation to other things which are black. But there's no absolute white. There is no absolute black. So is spirit and matter. There is no absolute spirit. There is no absolute matter. There are relative degrees within the one with which we are dealing, nature as a whole. So what we're looking at is not an ultimate anything, but characteristics of these two. For the purposes of this afternoon's session, we want to draw, our, we want to focus our attention on the spirit pole of this duality rather than the matter pole. We'll come back to the matter pole and we'll deal with that in later sections, but not yet. Now what is the nature of this spirit pole? To me, the one really giveaway phrase that she uses in the proem is she says, spirit, and then in parenthesis, or consciousness. She never elaborates this, or not to any great degree. She just puts it there as if it's not really terribly important, spirit or consciousness, and then goes on to talk about it in a series of abstract terms. But to me, this is the most fundamental insight into the nature of what is meant by spirit. Well, you see, I'm conscious, and I suspect you're conscious too. So when she says, or consciousness, I immediately know what she's talking about. Because I know what consciousness is. I might not be able to define it, but I have the experience of being conscious, aware, alive, um, interacting with my environment, perceiving what's going on around me, and so forth. And if that's true of me, then, to a degree, it's true of all else which lives. So when we talk about spirit, and we go on to talk about monad and the like, what we're really talking about is consciousness. 
And that is a fundamentally different perspective, and I think it's a much more fruitful line to pursue in our studies. If we, don't, if we ignore that, then very rapidly, terms like monad, whatever, however we then go on to qualify it, spiritual monads and divine monads and whatever else, rapidly just become words, and words become things, and then we're lost. We're rapidly back with where we were in our childhood uh, when people started talking about souls and you were told that you had a soul and you thought, well, where is this soul that I'm supposed to have? Uh, is it up there? Yeah, yeah. How is my mortal soul to be saved and how is it to be damned and so forth? And it was as if it were an object somehow or another which could burn in hell and could do all sorts of strange things. And it was only after you'd studied theosophy for a while that you realized that you didn't have a soul but you were a soul, and that whatever you felt yourself to be, your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, your spiritual intuitions, and everything else, all of that comprised really what your soul elements were. And the soul wasn't a thing at all, but it was, again, a process. Uh, it's not something that we could identify and find and locate and say, ah, here's Adam Walkup's soul. We can weigh it and measure it find out what its shape is and so forth. It's not like that, plainly. It is the, the process of my thoughts, feelings, experiences, memories, expectations, and everything which goes to make up the unique personality, individuality of Adam Walkup. That is my soul. So, I suggest, when we come to terms like monad, we should approach it in the same way. Should not fall into the same fallacy that we perhaps fell into in childhood. Maybe I malign you. Maybe you never did think this way. I certainly did. And we are inclined to think about spirit in the same way. My spirit. My monad. I went somewhere up there. I'm not quite too sure where it is or even what it is, but I know I've got one. Um, and ag again, fairly quickly, if we're not at all careful, even studying theosophy, it becomes an object out there somewhere, a thing. And clearly and plainly, it cannot possibly be a thing. But if we invert it and talk as I have done in terms of consciousness, then I'm conscious. So could not my spirit be here, my monad be here, in what I experience as consciousness right now? It could be an aspect of what I experience as consciousness right now. And in that way, it all comes home again. It all comes back to the center, rather than being somewhere out there. And that is how I'm going to approach what I have to say on this question of the kingdoms of nature. Fundamentally, then, looking at consciousness. Now, coming to the seven kingdoms of nature, We talk of seven kingdoms of nature in the limited environment of our present system of globes and wherever else, what we'll talk about later. We're not saying, as it says in this first paragraph, 2-1, that there are only and ever seven kingdoms of nature. I think this is quite an important point. Do not think that there are the, 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 the ladder of life consists of only seven, but there are many degrees. But with what we are concerned with, we need only concern ourselves with seven. Now, when we talk of these kingdoms of nature, each one of them is said to be an expression of either, in the terms that you will see in here, either the monad, and she uses a variety of terms, does Madame Blavatsky. Sometimes she uses the term monas, M-O-N-A-S, which gives you a rather more unitary idea. It's difficult to have a more unitary idea than monad, because monad means one anyway. But um, somehow in the usage of the term, they seem to get multiplied, and we talk about monads, rightly or wrongly, and she therefore introduces this term sometimes, monas, 
to bring you back to a more synthetic view, per perceptive and perception of the whole process. Sometimes she talks about monadic essence. People have different views as to what this is, but if uh, I just look at it in a straightforward English term, if somebody talks to me about vanilla essence, they're talking not about vanilla, but about something extracted from vanilla, which is uh, more vanilla than vanilla, if you like. And uh, you've got rid of the dross, and you're just left with the true juice of the fruit, or whatever vanilla is, and that's the essence. Well, so with monadic essence, um, it's something, again, taking one step back, it's something more fundamental than the apparency of a multiplicity of units of consciousness. And that is my view of the way this goes. Coming to the kingdoms of nature, another term which uh, I have introduced here, which again is not original, virtually none of this is original, I might hastily claim. Another word that is used, and Jeffrey used it this afternoon, is a life wave. And this to me has enormous appeal the analogy which is used in, I think it's 2-2, uh, two, two, but maybe it isn't. No, maybe it's later. 2-5, actually. It's the idea of the, the relationship between the wave and the ocean. We've already said that the nature is one thing, one of one substance, of one composition. Therefore, when we start talking about kingdoms of nature and monads and so forth, we're not talking about something in something else. We're not injecting something into an otherwise dead substance. Couldn't be that way if what we've said about the nature of cosmos is true. If spirit and matter are only aspects of it, then when we talk about monad or life waves or kingdoms of nature, we're not talking about something added to, something injected into an otherwise inert nature. We're talking about an aspect of that nature. And that's why I like this analogy of wave and ocean, or wave and lake, however you wish to look at it. If you see a wave moving across the surface of a pond or a lake or an ocean, however you view it, it's all one thing, isn't it? There's only one ocean. You haven't added a wave to the ocean in order to make a wave. Uh, it's, all, it's all part of a process. And what is characteristic of the kingdom of nature, using this analogy, is the movement within the medium. Water, lake, ocean, whatever it happens to be. We see an apparent movement through it. And that, to me, is exactly what this life wave, as they refer to it, is. So when we talk about the mineral kingdom or the plant kingdom or the animal kingdom, what we're looking at is that underlying wave which is moving through. Now, to me this is uh, has ramifications, has further uh, ideas which immediately follow from it. Another idea which is mentioned in this particular section is that we should not judge kingdoms of nature by the external forms that we see. We shouldn't judge plants merely by grasses and flowers and trees and shrubs and so forth. We sense, do we not, that there is a life animating those forms. We may not understand that life, but we sense that it is there. We, this is a fundamentally different position from the materialist biologist, if any such still exist, who would say that the plant is nothing other than the collection of atoms and molecules which make it up. It's nothing other than that. Well, what we would say, perhaps I'm in putting words into your mouth, what I would say, <laughs> perhaps we make it more accurate, is that we can sense within this whole process a life manifesting in those forms. Now, the life itself is not concerned with any individual form and is not concerned whether individual plants, trees, and so forth come or go, and whether they come or go, 
but there is a broad sweep, just as you see a wave moving through the water, and the water moving up and down, individual molecules moving up and down. So the broad sweep can be seen to move through it if your perspective is sufficiently far above it. So if we look at the plant kingdom, to take an example, look at the seasons, for instance. There is a broad sweep moving through any particular season from spring to autumn. And the plants grow and fall back, just like a cork bobbing on the ocean. The wave moves through. Well, this is just a cycle within a cycle within a cycle. But nonetheless, it is this plant kingdom which is responsible for that. It is the monadic life which is producing this flowering, in, in this example, in the plant kingdom. I believe exactly the same is true of all the kingdoms that we can directly perceive. It's easy, or relatively easy, to see in the plant kingdom. It's relatively easy, I think, to see in the animal kingdoms and to a degree in ourselves. It's more difficult in the mineral kingdom. Why? Well, because it doesn't seem to change much. But if you alter your time perspective, it certainly does. Our time perspective is so short that we don't see the mineral kingdom changing. But ask a geologist whether the mineral kingdom changes, and you say, are you kidding? Of course it changes. It's changing the whole time. Mountains are growing, valleys are appearing, continents are drifting about. Uh, the whole thing is in constant movement. As long as your time scale has shifted out into millions of years, rather than thinking in ones and tens of years. But if your time scale is different, then the mineral changes and can be seen to be move in movement and it, uh, therefore can be seen to be, in that sense, alive. But coming back to where we started, what about this consciousness? I started by saying that spirit or consciousness, monad or consciousness, monadic essence or consciousness, these have got to be, in some sense, equivalent terms. How does this apply, then? to the Seven Kingdoms. Well, this is where I would draw your attention to what I regard to be one of the most significant passages which uh, is to be found relating to this whole subject. This will be found on page 55 in the book. Perhaps you'd like to follow it there. If you want to look it up in the book, there's nothing to stop you doing that, but uh, this will be good enough. This passage discusses the relationship of one kingdom to another, and specifically man in relation to his monadic origins. I'd like you to look at that first paragraph, the first quoted paragraph in there, where she says, It would be very misleading to imagine a monad as a separate entity trailing its slow way in a distinct path through the lower kingdoms and after an incalculable series of transformations flowering into a human being. In her analogy, in short, that the monad of a Humboldt 19th century physicist, geologist, dates back to an atom of hornblende. This is her joke. Uh, it's a bit dated now, but uh, hum Humboldt was in fact responsible for having discovered this particular mineral. So this was her joke. I don't hear you laughing very loudly. It wasn't that funny, but uh, there it was. However, the point that she's making is this. If we look backwards, if we look backwards in time, from our own perspective, normally, as good theosophists, we will dutifully say, ah, yes, well, I've had a series of incarnations, and uh, before being Adam Walkup, I was so so and so and so and so and, and such and such. And it is as if we have a sort of spiritual genealogy, a sort of family tree, which is going back generation by generation. And you might think, well, where does this process stop? I'm not saying I think this, but I'm putting words into your mouths. You might, you might have argued like this, and you might have said, well, 
At some point, I graduated from the animal kingdom into the human kingdom, so going backwards in time, before I was human, <coughs> presumably I was animal. And then you might start tracing your animal family tree backwards through the higher, spe higher species of animal, through lower species, and so forth, until you got back to the plant kingdom. And you might have got into some difficulties here, and you might think, well, I don't know, perhaps I was a, a, the, a tree. I think that's pretty high form. So a sequence of trees, and then before that, a sequence of shrubs and a few grasses, and perhaps the odd lichen. And then back into the mineral kingdom, and back to your atom of hornblende. Well, that is what she is specifically denying. She's saying it's not like that. Your monad does not have that sort of genealogy, does not have that sort of origin, does not develop in that sort of way. And it's good to have this clearly stated, because otherwise we might fall into this uh, initially attractive way of looking at it. The second paragraph elaborates this idea. It's all on the same page. It's just my way of extracting it. The atom, she says, as represented in the ordinary scientific hypothesis, is not a particle of something animated by a psychic something destined after eons to blossom as a man. It is not that way. Individual atoms are not going anywhere. They are not uh, fundamental units of being which have an ultimate destiny to become man and God. If it's not that, what is it? Well, she says, but it is a concrete manifestation of the universal energy. Now there's mod science for you, isn't it? There's Einstein for you. Even before Einstein came along, the atom is not that, but is a concrete manifestation of the universal energy. E equals mc squared. What could be more clear? She is not saying that the atom is a, has any fundamental reality. It is a, a manifestation of the universal energy. And she goes on to elaborate. A sequential manifestation of the one universal monas. A manifestation in time sequence. Having no, again, it's process, which we were talking about this morning. Atoms are processes, not things. Now, she goes on to uh, give us a, a, a picture of just how the process does occur. And this next sentence where she says, the ocean of matter does not divide into its potential and individual drops until the sweep of the life impulse reaches the evolutionary stage of man-birth. Now, I'm going to say a little bit more about that, but before I do, I'd like you to look at the third one, where it says, the monadic essence begins to imperceptibly differentiate toward individual consciousness in the vegetable kingdom. Notice again, individual consciousness. You notice the stress here on consciousness? I'm not talking about things any longer talking about consciousness. Now, what does she mean by about the differentiating towards individual consciousness? Well, to elaborate what I think she means, and I do stress what I think she means here, to a degree, I think we need to go back to somewhere near first principles again. And I have one or two analogies, which I hope are going to be of some value to you. Our primal glyph, or symbol, which is introduced in the proem of the secret doctrine, is that of a circle, or it should be a circle, with a central point. Now, has it ever occurred to you that that's really you? It's not just a, an out there, somewhere or another symbol. But what it's actually talking about is you. You are this uh, circle and a point in the middle. And to illustrate that, I'd like to read you, to show you it's not entirely my idea, I'd like to read you a short passage from The Secret Doctrine. If you want to follow it, 
It's um, on page 65 of volume one of the original edition. I don't know the page number in the other editions, but it's uh, in stanza three, sloka two, and it will be in the first paragraph. Having just drawn this little diagram, you will now see the relevance of why I drew it. It brings before the mind's eye the picture of cosmos emerging from and in a boundless space, sorry, in boundless space, a universe as shoreless in magnitude, if not as endless in its objective manifestation. The simile of an egg also expresses the fact taught in occultism that the primordial form of everything manifested from atom to globe, from man to angel, is spheroidal. The sphere having been with all nations the emblem of eternity and infinity, a serpent swallowing its tail. To realize the meaning, however, the sphere must be thought of as seen from its center. You've got to get into the sphere. You've got to be there in the dot. There's no point looking at it from outside. <clears throat> the field of vision or of thought is like a sphere whose radii proceed from oneself in every direction and extend out into space, opening up boundless vistas all round. Now, that I like. Uh, that has to me enormous appeal because that marries up with exactly how I do perceive things from this point of view. From where I am, whatever I might be, it does seem that way, does it not? That I'm in the middle of an endless sphere. Uh, physically, it is so. Physically, I have a horizon which I can turn around and there it is. It depends how easily I can see that horizon. If I'm in the middle of a desert or in the middle of an ocean, the horizon is very obviously a circle surrounding me. And in the content of that circle is everything that I can currently see or perceive. But so it is in my mental sphere. I have a mental sphere as well, of which I am at the center. And in that mental sphere, I can conjure up memories and expectations, images, visualizations, sounds and perceptions, and I can fill my mental sphere with just whatever I like. But I'm at the center of it at all times. I couldn't possibly be anywhere else. I can't move off from the center because I am that center, and I take it with me wherever I go. So, this picture that we see here of the circle is fundamental to what we mean by being and consciousness. Now, if it's true of me, I believe it's going to be fundamentally true of consciousness of whatever form. The, con the quality of consciousness, the content of that consciousness will change. Plainly, it will change in the different degrees of being, in the different orders of life, the content, the experience, the faculty, what I can do, will differ enormously in scale. But it will always be this way. The pattern is set. Whatever being will always feel itself to be at the middle. Couldn't be anywhere else. And it will always perceive, in either a very limited or in an almost unlimited way, a circumference. And this is where she goes on to say, reading the last sentence from the quote I've just made, it is the symbolical circle of Pascal and the Kabbalists, quote, whose center is everywhere and circumference nowhere. Now, where have we heard that before? That's a familiar idea, isn't it? Whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. The center is everywhere because it's in each one of us. Hmm? And seeing as the universe is nothing but being anyway, the universe is spirit and matter, back to first principles, inescapably everything is conscious. Everything is conscious. There aren't any dead bits in the middle. It's all a question of degree. Everything is alive. Everything must have consciousness to a degree. Therefore, the center is everywhere. Everything has a center. Every process feels itself to be at the center. The center is everywhere. 
Its circumference is only defined by its being, by what it feels it can perceive. It is an illusion that it is limited, so its circumference is nowhere. Now, if you accept this little picture that all being is built on this pattern of circle in this nature, then we can move on from there. Supposing we say that in the mineral kingdom, being is of this character, absolutely unitary. There, there is only one center as far as the mineral kingdom, the mineral life wave is concerned. As far as all experience is concerned, it is all referred to the same center. Now, in terms of experience, I have absolutely no idea what that means. Absolutely none. I cannot conceive what mineral existence is like. My imagination doesn't go that far. It goes a long way, but not that far. But let us suppose that a process of differentiation now starts to take place. And instead of there being one center, an arbitrary series of points begin to differentiate out from this central point. Uh, they don't take any, there's no significance in the number of lines. Now, what will happen as this takes place? As soon as it's just a tiny way out from here, what you now have is a series of very nearly overlapping concentric circles. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, it's very, I'm not very good at drawing these sorts of things, and I'm about to draw on the bottom of the screen, which Elise told me immediately not to do. But you would have a group of centers like that, and around this one, there would be a circle. Around this one, there would be a circle. Around this one, a circle, mm -hmm. and so forth. Can I, can I take it that you follow what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. Now, there is only a little <coughs> bit of separation between each of the circles. So there is a bit of individuality, but an awful lot is in common still. An awful lot is in common. The overlap is enormous. So there are apparently a few centers now beginning to emerge, but the overlap is dominant. So in terms of experience, content of consciousness, it's almost totally the same. So what we're looking here is the life wave animating the whole mass of mineral forms. So the globe is one global mineral form and one life animates the whole of these mass of mineral forms. As we move towards the vegetable kingdom, the plant kingdom, we move away from that almost unitary experience into the beginnings of individual centers of consciousness, but we haven't got there yet. What we're ultimately going to end up with is us, who have individual centers completely distinct from everything else. But at the moment, the overlap is almost total. Then if we were to take this process and go a bit further, I think you can probably see where I'm going. That doesn't work, does it? Uh, it's inside. Yes, if I do that, I should be covered in green gunge, but proud of that. I'm not a proud man. I don't mind having green hands. <laughs> At the next stage, then, if we imagine that the centers have now moved off a good bit further from the original center here, then there is overlap, but it's not nearly so much. Yes? And so it goes. There is a lot which is now individual. This arc here would represent, uh, what should we say, a view of the process unique to that particular center, but the rest of it is shared. This part of the arc through here cuts through other circles and it therefore represents common areas of experience. Modern children would understand this because it's all about set theory and uh, they're, all, they're very keen on set theory now, but... Uh, set theory. Yes. Mm -hmm. mm. We, won't, we won't elaborate that now. <laughs> 
do you see where we're going? If, if we could get to a point where these points were sufficiently separated out from the center from which they originally emerged, then we could ultimately get to a point where this circle didn't actually overlap any other circle at all. And then we would be back to me and my center, and we would have a circle down here with a, with a center uh, with apparently no overlap with any other. And at that point, I believe, we have reached what we are after in the human kingdom, a clear sense of individuality. I am myself and no other. Now, there are an awful lot of uh, drawbacks to this point of view. And having achieved that, we're going to have to undo it all over again mm -hmm. and uh, re-go re back to the, to the center again. But this is what it's for, to get to this point so that we could know ourselves as ourselves and no other, not shared with anybody else, not shared with any other entity, a unique center with a unique set of experiences. And that is what I believe we are after. And that is why it says, in the passage quoted here, the tendency of segregation into individual monads is gradual and in the higher animals comes almost to the point. Now, I wouldn't want you to take this diagram too literally. It is only an aid, a raft across the river. Don't take it too literally. Uh, it's intended to help, but not to get too attached to. But that is, I believe, what is fundamental about this whole picture of the, uh, the evolution, the progressive evolution through the seven kingdoms of nature. When, as we will do in due course, we talk about the time scale in which this process occurs, it is enormous, absolutely enormous, and very, very gradual, and requires the accumulation of an enormous amount of experience to reach this particular point. But it's, a, uh, I believe, a very useful perspective to try and, uh, try and draw on if you can. I have another little analogy for what it's worth. Uh, which is very similar to this, which you can, if you like, visualize this in a rather different way. Imagine, if you will, that you've just arrived on a very strange planet, which is Earth-like in all respects, and that you can live and breathe on it. But apparently, the, this planet uh, is 100% water on the surface. There are no land masses. And there you are, sitting in, the, in a little rowing boat or craft in, on, the, on the surface of this particular planet. Now, from your perspective, you are at the center of your universe as it now, uh, as it now finds itself. And the universe is, uh, the, the, sorry, the circumference, the, 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 the horizon is perfectly circular as you look about you. The center is you, and the circumference is what you see. Now imagine that there are a number of other people who've also, by mischance, landed on this same planet. Then they all perceive the world in exactly the same way that you do. And they all think themselves to be at the center of it until one of the other boats happens to drift across the horizon. And then he suddenly realizes that he's not alone and that there are other people in this particular uh, world that he happens to have uh, come to. Then, he is an object as far as you're concerned, but you're an object as far as he's concerned. So we've got the subject and objects now have just begun to interact with one another, but perceive each other to be the opposite to themselves. You're always subject, I, consciousness of the center, and everything else is now drifting into view, so to speak, as objects within your, uh, within your view. We have... For all the beings who happen to be on the surface of this particular uh, imaginary planet, we have this view, don't we, of a series of limited perspectives, each with it seeing his own circle, his own limited horizon. And there seems to be no absolute perspective at all. 
Let's suppose that the North Pole of this particular imaginary planet is more spiritual and the South Pole is more material. You could say that the people who are nearer the North Pole were more nearly uh, evolved or more highly evolved beings and the ones who ended up at the South Pole were the, the, the less evolved and the more materialistic and so forth. But nonetheless, they all still see only a limited circle from their own point of view. There is only one point from which this whole sphere can be seen. Wouldn't, it'll do you no good to leave the surface of the planet and go as far away as you can because you'd only ever be able to see half of it. Your circle would expand to see just half of it and no more. Just as we can see the, the moon in the sky, we can just see half of it. We can't see the back of the moon. And there is no, it wouldn't matter how far away we went, we would never see the back of the moon. There is only one viewpoint where you would actually see all of it, and that is if you were at the center of the sphere. Yes? So if you want to push this very fanciful analogy to its logical conclusion, the one synthesizing viewpoint would be at the center, where instead of there being a circle su surrounding you, there would now be a sphere surrounding you, and all the experience of all the beings floating on the surface would now be yours as well. Back to the unitary point in the circle from which we all started, perhaps. Adam, you know that uh, reminds me in, uh, in Boston, uh, Massachusetts, not here, mm. at the Christian Science um, Publishing House building, there is the most amazing experience. They have a globe. If you ever go there, by all means, go to see this. Uh, the globe of the world with all of the countries and oceans uh, on it, a complete sphere, and you walk into the middle of it across a glass oh, bridge, and this is all illuminated, and you are at the very center of the entire world. Right, right. And you, you can see the entire uh, globe of mm. our world, mm. its oceans, its the continents, and countries mm. are all colored, mm. so it's all illuminated, mm -hmm. and you're on a glass bridge, therefore, so you can see down right. as well as right. up, if you right. like. Uh, it's the most amazing experience, and it's precisely what right. you're talking about. Right, right, mm -hmm. yes, marvelous, <laughs> marvelous. I didn't know anybody had actually brought it up. Yeah. That's super. Mm. How many people can you sit in the middle? There's an answer to that question, and you should know it. <laughs> Just one. <laughs> but, but seriously, if you, if we, if we were to follow this process through on the reverse cycle, what do we, what do we read at the towards the end of the uh, the seventh stanza uh, about the great day be with us? And thou shalt re-become myself and others, thyself and me. It's not as if we're going to be a whole collectivity at the end of the process. Just one. Just one. However, that's as unimaginable to us now as what the mineral was when it started, I guess. Mm. Is there anything else which I've, uh, I've said or that you've read in here that you want to talk about at this stage. <coughs> I went on rather longer there than I'd been intending before I asked you if you had any questions, but then I had a few introductory remarks to say. I believe it does. I believe it does. I think um, I believe it can be very much extended <coughs> along those lines, and I believe that this gives a very, a very clear hint as to the direction in which we're going, uh, both as humanity and beyond the human kingdom. This, um, having reached this point of uh, ultimate separation here, then we can't go any further, as far as that line is concerned, and the only direction in which we can go is. Uh, Back, back the way we've come, but this time taking with us what we've gained in the process. So I believe that uh, in one form or another, yes, this is what exactly what we must be doing. 
But how we do it is another matter. Um, at this stage, most people would be terrified at doing that because they would lose their, they feel they would lose their individuality in the process. Oh, I would be lost. I would be you know, drowned in the hole. And indeed, if it happened too soon, I think you would be drowned in the hole. Uh, W-H-O-L-E, you understand, <laughs> not H-O-L-E. But I believe that this is the nature of the process, the return process. There's one rather fascinating reference in the Secret Doctrine to the nature of the Dhyana Chahanic kingdoms, where they say individuality is a characteristic of a hierarchy, not of the individual members that make it up. Now, isn't that interesting? In other words, to talk of individual Dhyana Chohans has little meaning. To talk of them as particular groups has significance and has considerable meaning. If you want me to pursue that a little further, I'll give you a rather uh, fanciful uh, illustration of that, which uh, comes from my Copa science fiction reading. Uh, what I regard as an excellent book, um, science fiction book, was written by Fred Hoyle. It was called The Black Cloud. Some of you may have read it. It's a science fiction story which describes what happens when a cloud of interstellar gas uh, arrives in the solar system and ends up positioned between the Earth and the Sun uh, and causes all sorts of havoc on Earth. Latterly in the book it turns out that there is an intelligence inside the cloud and they eventually manage to establish radio communications with this intelligence in the, crowd, in the cloud. And at one point one of the scientists uh, is trying to work out how this cloud would have evolved and become the way it was, and argues that probably what happened is a lot of little clouds would have aggregated, each with a certain amount of intelligence in it. And one of the scientists says, well, doesn't that mean that you would have ended up with not just one entity in the cloud, but a whole collection of entities in the cloud? And you haven't got one beast, as he puts it, in the cloud, but a whole collection of beasts. And he, uh, the other one, whose theory it is, says, no, I believe not because the volume of communication between the two would be so great that you wouldn't think of them as being individuals any longer. Mm. Now, supposing that that were true of us, supposing that instead of having to communicate with speech and words the way we do, which is slow, sequential, very imperfect as a medium of communication, supposing that you and I could communicate mind to mind, and that supposing that everything that I've said in the last hour, I could have just communicated in a flash to you. I could have shared my thought processes. Not only would it have been much, much quicker, it would have also been much more accurate because you would have known immediately what I was thinking, wholly, without having to explain. You would have just gone, aha, as Joy was saying this morning, and that would have been that. Now, supposing that you had this sort of access to my mind and I to yours and we to everybody else's, how would you know any longer whose thought it was? How would you know where the thought originated? Would you care? And when a memory occurred, was it my memory? Well, initially you'd know, but after a while you wouldn't know any longer. You wouldn't care. You might still have a physical individuality, perhaps, but more and more, you would be part of a greater, richer, fuller whole in which you would feel yourself to be the centre, and so would everybody else, but with an awful lot of a common and shared experience. In other words, we would be back to uh, one of my earlier diagrams with an awful lot of overlapping circles, but each, each one now feeling itself to be the centre and consciously the centre, and eventually, of course, it would all return to a centre, and every one of them would think, ah, I am the centre. But it wouldn't really be that way. Mm. But just a, just a little illustration, which has always rather pleased me. Anything else arising out of what's written here? Reference, can I give you the, the, what you quoted just now about individuality is the characteristic of their respective hierarchies is in point number six of the summary 
Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's good to know. <laughs> now, there are, and we do have a little bit more time if you're if you're not completely punch drunk from four sessions. Uh, do you want to relate the size of those circles to the uh, development of new parties? No. <laughs> 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 Do you? I just wondered whether they wondered how some circles got big and others were small. Now, circles are purely notional, and they don't, uh, they weren't no, intended. It's a process of energy. It's a process of energy. Energy process in itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. True. Do you then? see these circles, if I can put it this way, uh, as dependent upon the vibratory capacity of the point, which in the spheroidal movement then, the circumgyratory movement as the stanzas put it, create then mm. the circles. Yes. By, so that the oh, size spinning. then, to come to Jeffrey's mm. point, the size then is dependent upon the action or the energy, mm. perhaps is a better term, mm. e equals mc squared, mm. the energy within the point of consciousness. Mm. Mm. I would perhaps uh, myself have expressed it very slightly differently. I think we're I think we're on exactly the same lines here. Uh, the size of the sphere, I would re relate directly to what the point had managed to project mm -hmm. into the sphere, mm -hmm. into the circle. Yeah, that's another way of saying it. Mm -hmm. yes. And that is what uh, experience and life is all about. Mm -hmm. And the spheres are notionally, therefore, larger mm -hmm. because of the greater content. Mm -hmm. What has, we have managed to make external from the center. It's interesting the way, the way psychologists talk yeah. about this process of externalization uh, and uh, of learning, of making objective what is inherently there all along. Mm -hmm. One can see this being ref the same process being reflected into the psychological yeah. model. And I believe exactly for, the, for, the, for this reason that this is exactly uh, a paradigm of the, of the process that we're looking at. This would lead them to the re overlapping yes. process, which comes, for example, as one approaches the mystical experience. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly so, yes. There we touch it for a while. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, the circle, mm -hmm. the, uh, the circumference mm -hmm. disappears to infinity almost. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. But there's much else besides mm -hmm. which is uh, including, uh, included in that. What is it which has restricted you in the first place? The first place well, yes. it's ego structures mostly, and you know it's what you've managed to clutter the the content of the sphere with. You've projected not uh, not good things, but a lot of rubbish, uh, partially understood uh, things, I believe, into the sphere, which is what limits you, what blocks you off from a cosmic view. And you will say, the Adams, that that point is a, a monastic uh, energy. But because uh, because uh, it said the universe is made of of uh, mind. It's mind made only. Mm. So the point will be an energy of of, of mind, the which point? is in mm. in one way a process of consciousness. Mm. Uh, yes and no. Um, mind is central to this whole process. Certainly, as far as man is concerned, we will understand this far better in terms of mind. What is the content of this sphere? We will certainly understand in terms of mind because it relates so much to the creative processes. Uh, to say that it is the nature of the point uh, is that, no, I wouldn't say so. The nature of the point goes right back to the root of cosmos itself. Manas I regard only as one of the characteristic modes, shall we say, of the manifestation of the process. For us, absolutely central to 
the way in which we manifest our individuality, our human characteristics, and so forth. Um, I wouldn't have willingly put it at the very heart of the process. I would mean, think we could, because it's activated only mm. at the certain stage of the entry of the Manasapukas for us. True, for true. I hesitated because yes. uh, one talks of universal yes. mind, and yes. therefore yes. intelligence is innate in the whole process. Uh, but in the sense that we're individualized and have thinking and egos, then that certainly is a later development. Anything else? Yes. I think I'm recapping my own way. I'm asking, would you say the individual point of consciousness takes has all its potentialities or draws its potentiality from the powerhouse of the universal consciousness with all its potentialities in it? It's ultimately not different from it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to draw anything. Mm -hmm. It's not different from it. Um, that really is the you know, the root of the whole thing. Goes right back to you know, to the very heart of the core of cosmos. It ultimately, couldn't be different from it. All of this apparent uh, manifestation is so much. I hesitate to use the word illusion because I don't like it um, because it seems to have a, 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 a denigratory context to it, a derogatory sort of context to it. I, I believe the the illusory separateness is vital to the whole process. Um, but uh, the, in the, insofar as we feel ourselves to be separate, it is only uh, an apparency. It's not real. We, the heart core never was anything other than uh, identical with the, uh, with the core. As Ianthi will no doubt remind us, Atman and Brahman are one. Fundamental identity of the universe. Oversoul, oh, yes. Hmm. <laughs> Well, it is 5.30, ladies and gentlemen. You have had a, a feast, I think. That'll probably keep you going for another year, but unfortunately you've got another two weeks. So.